Flying around America often sucks. Travel troubles continue for passengers at airports across the country this morning. Flights are often delayed or canceled more than any other country. Our flight got canceled again. The travel chaos, more than 2,000 flights have been canceled all across the country. And our airports are bad. You won't find a single U.S. airport in the list of top 10 best airports around the world. Los Angeles Airport is ranked one of the worst in the country. Now to breaking news at LA. LAX, where Terminal 1 has been evacuated. In fact, you'll have to go all the way to number 18 to find an American airport on the list. And it's the US where you might have to wait several hours just to get off your plane because there might not be a gate available. A nearly $19 billion project to expand and improve one of the country's busiest airports. Things are trying to change. At LAX, you see a lot of signs like this that are talking about the new developments here. But why is the world's biggest economy, the country with some of the worst flight delays and worst airports on the planet. Every few months lately, there seems to be massive delays that impacts millions of passengers. Last year, more than 128,000 flights were canceled in the US in the first half of the year alone. So what exactly is happening here? Well, there's a shortage of a lot. You've got a shortage of airplanes, a shortage of pilots, a shortage of air traffic controllers, I guess the only thing there's not a shortage of is passengers, people who fly. Seth Kaplan is an aviation and travel expert. He tells me the demand for flights is way, way, way higher than the supply right now. Anybody who's hoping for low fares soon uh, is probably going to be disappointed. Think of all these cancellations as a traffic jam on the freeway. When too many cars are trying to get on the on-ramp, cars can barely move. And that's what's happening when so many passengers are trying to fly, because airlines are booking more flights than they can physically handle or have enough crew to be able to work. But it's not just that. Nearly two-thirds of all Southwest flights were canceled today. Over Christmas, Southwest canceled more than 16,000 flights, mostly blaming a tech meltdown of its servers. When you rely on these systems and these systems go down, uh, it Certainly, we, we see the impact of that. Airlines are companies. They need profits. They're not like the train or bus systems that get to prioritize the greater public's ability to get around over money. I mean, flying is nice to have, not a must-have. You don't need to fly to get to school or to your job. So profits are the priority. How do we fly enough that we're really efficient and our costs are low, but not so much, that we're not <laughs> that the fares aren't too low and all that? That's a game that they're always playing. Here are six reasons why American airports are so bad and flights are often delayed. The first is basic economics. Too many people want to fly, but there are not enough seats. Consumers want to fly safe, be on time, and not have to pay too much. Now we're in this part of the cycle where the supply and demand balance is, well, out of balance from, from a, a consumer standpoint. And there's no two ways about the fact that, that fares are going to be higher. Uh, for as long as that lasts. But if we bought less seats, prices wouldn't go down either because airlines would just have less flights running. And, and the answer is that their unit costs also go up when they're not flying as much. So the cost of carrying each seat, each mile, which, which is just the airline measure of unit cost, every industry has one, that cost goes up when they're flying less because basically they're less efficient. The problem is when flying less reduces the number of seats, then you get into supply and demand economics of even fewer seats with all of this consumer demand that we're seeing, which would tend to squeeze fares up. So there's no good answer in the short term. Number two is infrastructure. Airports in the US are old and often outdated. And it's a bit ironic because the American aviation industry is so ahead of, say, Asian countries that our airports here are way worse. While go to other countries, they're often newer, modern, with way better designs. Take Los Angeles Airport, for example. It was never designed to handle the number of passengers and planes that it does today. It's had to keep adding more areas for humans, for planes. Even its security checkpoints were never designed for the kinds of screenings that passengers would have to do after 9-11. All of this leads to long wait times, congestion, and just overall crowded facilities. And airports aren't exactly what they would be if we were just starting with a clean sheet of paper today and, 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 and starting the industry. And that's just the, the nature of infrastructure that is legacy infrastructure. Number three is the lack of amenities. If you land in Taipei, or Seoul, you will see a place for showers, and they provide towels, and all of this is totally free. Meanwhile, in American airports, you'd be lucky to find an exclusive airport lounge offering you a shower. 
Many criticize U.S. airports for its lack of dining options or even entertainment. Yes, entertainment at an airport. When I visited Singapore Airport, I made a whole video series about how it has relaxing loungers, pools, and a butterfly garden. And it even designs its terminals with carpeting to absorb sound and give a more relaxing feel. And without the right amenities, this can make your journey feel long and tiring. But remember, this is an industry that needs to make good profits. So why would American airports dedicate space to, well, butterflies? You know, airports might say, well, hey, we want lots of shopping opportunities because that's lots of revenue for the airport, which might in turn, from the airport's perspective, help keep costs lower for airlines. So you know, you've got the same gate at an airport that you're paying a certain amount every month for, let's say, uh, and you don't fly as much using that gate. Well, then the cost of that gate serving each passenger actually goes up and you can take that logic and carry out to everything airlines do. Number four is limited airspace. In Los Angeles alone, there are five airports. That collectively serves well more than 100 million passengers every year. I mean, that's more than the population of most countries. You have these very highly constrained airports, but then you have high-speed rail that, that's very effective in Europe and, 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 and connects a lot of people in ways that we don't really have alternatives in the US. We depend more on, on, on airlines here to connect cities because of some public policy reasons, less support for high-speed rail, for example, but also it would just our geography. We are much more spread out. So imagine LAX airport is already so congested and you have so many terminals, airlines, and even more airports nearby. You can quickly see how this could get complicated really fast. You also need what's called slots, landing and takeoff slots. I mean, permission to take off and land at a certain time at a given airport. So it's not enough to have the airplane and the gate and the pilots and all the rest of it. You also need specific permission to take off and land. In the US, at most airports, with notable exceptions, you don't. If you've got an airplane, a pilot's flight attendant at a gate, you can generally come and go when you want. Number five is ownership and management. Unlike some countries with centralized airport authorities, the US has a complex web of ownership and management structures for its airports. This web can create challenges in service quality across the different airports that impact the overall experience. See, US airports for the most part are publicly owned and operated by a county or a city or state or in some cases, as a public authority, while in a place like Singapore, its airport is simply owned by the Ministry of Finance. And there, everything is seen holistically. So if the airport can attract more people, then its economy grows because so does tourism and conferences. But in a place like the US, it's just way more complicated than that, with too many moving parts. While our airports are undoubtedly bad, things could be changing. A number of US airports started to abandon the public model and turned to private money to fund billion dollar projects. In 2016, New York State and Port Authority partnered with Delta Airlines and LaGuardia Gateway Partners to completely rebuild the airport, with LaGuardia Airport undergoing an $8 billion overhaul. Well, that is what a groundbreaking looks like. Meanwhile, LAX is getting a $15 billion overhaul that will add an electric train system. Yes, right now it doesn't have a train. In the airline industry in general, there's always kind of this uh, push and pull between airlines and airports. They're kind of thrown into this marriage together and, and you'll have uh, airports that airlines are think, think are, are were built too expensively and then the air, airlines and their passengers kind of have to pay. So America's airport problem and airport delay problem kind of makes it a victim of its own success. The U.S. aviation industry accounts for about 5% of the country's total GDP. People want to fly, many need to fly, and the economy needs you to fly too. And even if your flight is canceled, well, you'll just have to take the next one, whenever that may be.